Hello, people of the internet, my name is Johnny, and welcome back to another video on the Five Nights at Freddy's Fazbear Freud's books. I'm sure you all know by now, but the ninth entry in the Fazbear Freud's book series comes out in two days. The long-awaited puppet carver, previously named the Pupper Carver, kind of concerning when you think about that. Now you may be thinking, oh gosh, Johnny, I can't wait two days. I need to know the secrets of this book right now. Well, I mean, luckily for you, you clicked on the right gosh darn video. That's right, in today's video, I'm going to be summarizing all three of the stories in Fazbear Frights, book number nine, The Puppet Carver, as well as the Stitch Wraith epilogue at the end of the book. So it should go without saying, but of course, there's going to be major spoilers in this video. I'm summarizing all of the stories. If you don't want to be spoiled, click off the video. The book comes out in two days again, so just wait until it's out and then go read it. But if you don't care about spoilers, then I highly recommend hitting the like button and also subscribing to the channel, even if you think you're subscribed. Unfortunately, YouTube will sometimes unsubscribe you, so just double check. And let's start off with story number one, The Puppet Carver. The base description for the story is consumed by failure, desperate to keep his kitty pizzeria from bankruptcy, Jack lets his animatronics tech pitch him a new invention that might just give him some perspective. Once again, final warning, everything from here on out is going to be spoiler territory. I got these summaries from Smear over on Twitter and also on the official FNAF Wikipedia page. They're both linked down below. And now let's hop right into the summaries. Jack runs a failing pizzeria called the Pizza Playground. After the third animatronic in a month breaks down, he angrily orders his employees Porter and Sage to repair it. Porter proudly tells Jack the invention that he's been working on, a machine that cuts cheap slabs of wood into functional animatronics. Jack coldly dismisses his ideas and tells him to get back to work. From here, the story alternates between Jack's life and sections of a novel written by Sage. Sage's novel is called The Puppet Carver, and it's about a wooden puppet named Sylvester who wishes to be real. His creator only gives him the abilities to see, hear, and smell. Sylvester wants to be able to touch and experience emotions, so he pays the fixer to give him the remaining senses. He is connected to a machine and feels extreme pain, but with that pain comes pleasure. His body is shocked to life and can now feel everything. The novel ends with him holding his newborn daughter in his hands. Meanwhile, for Jack, his life becomes worse. Porter tries to show off the puppet carver machine to him, but it breaks down, pelting splinters into everyone's faces. Jack makes everyone clean up the mess and then fires all of his workers in a fit of rage. He even yells at both his wife and son for spending too much money. Later in the night, Jack hears a ticking noise coming from the machine. He crawls inside, but the door suddenly swings shut. And the saws and blades come dangerously close to him. Miraculously, a loud bang is heard, and the blades stop in their tracks. Jack escapes the machine and gains a new outlook in life after coming so close to death. He decides to apologize to all the people he hurt in his life. While buying donuts for his family, he hears footsteps behind him in the parking garage. As the footsteps become more wet sound, and sloshy, he hides in an abandoned office building to try and stay safe. However, pink goo enters through the cracks of the door and the slime follows him through the building. When he is finally cornered, he sees the being as made up of pink slime, organs, and mechanical parts. When the being reaches out to Jack, he feels unimaginable pain the pain he caused towards others throughout his life. Before the pain suddenly stops and the creature disappears. Jack finally reaches out to all the people he had hurt in his life, including rehiring all the workers he fired. Porter decides to work on a newer version of the machine to impress Jack. When Sage disposes of the old machine, he notices an odd smell coming from it. He pulls out the waste tray to find pink slime mixed with organs. Confused by what it is, he simply throws it away in the dumpster. And that is the summary for the first story in the Puppet Carver, appropriately named The Puppet Carver. So a few things to dissect here and a couple notes I want to share with you. Number one, yes, the Fazgu is returning. And this is actually the first time ever ever in the Fazbear Fright books that a character exclusive to the books returns. If you don't know, the Fazgu, it's so weird and complicated. It first showed up and he told me everything from, I think it was the cliffs? And now, it's back. 
Why? I don't really know. It could be Scott trying to tell us, hey, the Fazgu is really gosh darn important, so pay attention to it. Or they just thought it was something interesting to throw in there, but I highly doubt that. Also, the animatronic that breaks down during the month as mentioned in the summary is a pig animatronic. So either that is a reference to, or it directly is Pig Patch from FNAF 6 Pizza Sim. And now let's talk about the puppet cover itself, because apparently, it's not those dolls on the cover of the book, which is so weird. In fact, the dolls don't even show up in the book. So Scott, and the person who illustrated the cover, purposely put those three animatronics who looked like Freddy, Bonnie, and Chica on the cover, but they did not appear anywhere in the story itself. Why? I feel a bit cheated. Honestly, by that, I think it's really dumb that those dolls were on the cover and then just don't show up in the story at all. Especially because they were designed after Freddy, Bonnie, Chica. Like, just why would you do that? But yeah, that is the first story, the puppet cover. Now let's move on to story number two, Jump for Tickets. The official description is frustrated by an unfair arcade game, Colton throws himself into re-engineering the device at any cost. Colton is at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza to celebrate his little cousin Aiden's birthday party. Aiden invites him to play the arcade game Jump for Tickets. The game takes place in the Ticket Pulverizer, where the player must jump up and down to knock tickets from the machine's walls. Coils the Birthday Clown is an animatronic that invites kids to play the game. Colton finds out that the game has an unfair advantage where little kids were more likely to win than older ones. Desperate to win, he devises a plan to break into Freddy's later and fix the machine. After getting the tools from his uncle, he breaks into the pizzeria the next morning and reworks the machine. However, it turns out that he made the game more unfair than it was before. He spends the next few days obsessed with fixing the machine to the point where his grades were failing and he becomes distant from his family. Finally ready to fix the ticket pulverizer, Colton sneaks into Freddy's three hours before it opens. He is greeted by Coils, the birthday clown, and realizes that he is being followed by it. He quickly hides inside a compartment of the ticket pulverizer and begins work on the machine. But when he is finished, the panel door to the compartment is locked, and Coils, the birthday clown, stands outside of it. Colton steadily loses oxygen over the next few hours as he reflects on his life. He suffers a mental breakdown inside of the cramped space of the machine as he worries that he will die in there. He begins losing his sense of reality when he hears the sound of people entering the pizzeria, and specifically the ticket pulverizer turning on. He screams for help, but no one hears him. The story switches to the perspective of Bella, the new birthday girl. She enters the ticket pulverizer and jumps up and down, but the machine slows down and breaks. The manager comes to inspect the machine, but Coils the birthday clown prevents him from getting too close. Coils holds the manager's hand and points to the base of the machine, and its usually smiling face is now a tragic frown. The manager believes that he can see tears coming down its face. Eden hugs Coils and tells him to not be sad like Colton, and he reveals that he is saving his tickets to buy a present for him. Coils hugs Aiden back, and the manager walks past them to put an out-of-order sign on the machine. So a few things to note. Number one, apparently there's a few different, like, arcade games, or just games in the pizzeria. One of them is called BB's Ball Drop, of course, very similar to BB's Air Adventure from FNAF 3. And another one is called Dee Dee's Fishing Hole. Of course, probably a reference to the same exact game in FNAF World. So let's talk about that ending. What the heck happened? Hopefully it's made more clear in the books, but I'm guessing that Colton probably died in the ticket pulverizer and went on to possess the, the birthday clown coils. Not exactly sure how the face of the animatronic can change from happy to sad with tears, but okay. Also, don't really know why Aiden would suddenly just go up to Coils, hug him, and say, yo, I'm gonna buy you a cool present with all these tickets I've got. Like, does Aiden know what happened? Is he in all this? Does he know that uh, Colton is most likely possessing 
Coils, I, I'm so confused. And also Coils the Clown itself. Now we have seen a clown in FNAF before. It was a poster in the back alley of FNAF 6. It also showed up in Curse of Dreadbear. And the story itself is very similar. It seems to hide and seek. So maybe there's a connection there. I think that story had like Shadow Bonnie in it and Shadow Bonnie came out of a arcade machine. I don't know, I haven't properly read the story itself. So that is the second story jump for tickets. Now let's move on to the third and final story before the epilogue. The story is called Pizza Kit and the official description goes as followed. Molly's best friend goes missing on a tour of the Freddy's Pizza Factory. She knows what really happened, but her guilt isn't the only thing threatening to eat her alive. Now I think this is one of the weirdest stories, not only because I think it's so far the most um, gory in the book, but also because the description I just read to you does not match up with the story at all. Instead of Morley's friend going missing in the factory, it's Morley herself that goes missing. And also Morley and her friend's names get mixed up in the story a whole bunch. It's a complete mess if I'm being honest. So here we go. Peyton and Morley are best friends and are in the same home economics class with their teacher, Miss Crutchfield. Mrs. Crutchfield announces the class will be going on a field trip to the Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Kit Factory to both partake in a tour of the factory alongside making their own pizza kits to cook for the class. The factory Factory has machinery rooms for pretty much every pizza topping, and during the tour, Molly convinces Peyton to sneak off from the group. They explore the large machines that make the toppings for the pizzas and stumble upon a steamy room full of large vats of tomato sauce. They both go on a catwalk to see the vats from above. Molly taunts her friend by jumping on the catwalk and leaning on the railing, but the railing breaks and she falls down and disappears in the steam. Peyton can't find her friend's body on the floor and she fears she died falling in the vat of tomato sauce. As Peyton herself has anxiety problems, she decides to go back to the group in a sense of self-preservation. Mrs. Crutchfield asks her where Molly has gone and she guiltily tells her she does not know. Later, Molly's mother begins searching for her daughter. Peyton lies to her that she doesn't know anything about her disappearance. Molly then is reported missing and the guilt is eating at Peyton for the next few days. She assumes her friend had died and fallen into the tomato vat, boiling her alive. Peyton has a nightmare where she returns to the Freddy Fazbear's pizza kit alone. She is in the room with the vat of tomato sauce and there is a large pot of sauce on the top of a fire. Freddy Fazbear takes Molly's arm foot and severed head and places it in the pot. When she returns to school, her home economics class begins eating the pizza kits from the factory. Peyton's kit is the only one different from her classmates. The sauce seemed to be like blood, the crust seemed to be like skin, and the pepperoni seemed to be like a tongue. Peyton tells herself to stop overreacting and to just eat the pizza. She then realizes that the pizza was Molly and that she had to eat the pizza to remove the evidence. As she eats the pizza, she notes a grisly and metallic taste. Throughout the entire day, she has a horrific stomach ache, believing she has really eaten her dead best friend's remains. She has a second nightmare that night where she feels pressure in her stomach after finishing the pizza. Her body begins to expand and Peyton tries to make herself vomit in the bathroom to get rid of whatever is in her stomach. She feels something moving from her stomach up her body and she begins to choke as it reaches her throat. Suddenly, Molly's hand reaches out of her mouth and tries to crawl out. The arm retreats into her body and now she feels lumps on her face and the skin is stretched. Her eyes are blasted out from their eye sockets from the pressure. Molly's flesh and tissue comes out of her nose, mouth, ears, and empty eye sockets, but the pressure only increases. She continues spewing out Molly until she's quote, emptied out and remains alive through the whole process. Peyton wakes up from her nightmare and she vomits to relieve herself. She hears loud rustling outside of her house and fears that it is Molly wanting revenge for abandoning her. She then feels that what is outside of her house is not Molly, but what was left of her. Peyton climbs on the roof and waits for her to leave, however the railing is unstable and breaks. The story switches to Molly's perspective, revealing that she was fine all this time and enjoyed being missing. The entire segment 
with Peyton seeing human remains as pizza condiments, was part of Peyton's paranoia and guilt for her friend's disappearance. Instead, when Molly fell, she survived the drop and hid out in the factory overnight. Molly visits Peyton's house to let her know she is okay and alive. She hears a sound coming from the other side of the house and finds Peyton on the ground with a snapped neck. Molly screams. Okay, I, I don't even know what I can talk about in this story. Um, I guess the Freddy's Pizza Factory could be a reference to Candy's 2, which took place at a factory where someone went missing. I don't know, man. This is a messed up story. I don't like it. It's... it's... eh, no. And I also don't get why Morley and Peyton got mixed up so much. But yeah, that is the third story, Pizza Kit. Let's just move on to the epilogue. After some digging, Larson found 30 samples worth of blood in the ball pit. Larson receives the results of the blood samples which were tested in a lab. All 30 samples came from one person, with each sample coming from a different year, due to each one having different amounts of degradation. Larson deduces that something has been bleeding inside the ball pit for over three decades, and is determined to find the source. He suspects that it may tie back to the Stitchwraith and potentially help him find out if it's good or evil. Some time passes as Jake and the girl he rescued continue to hide out in the shed. The thing crawling outside has disappeared. Jake returns with some food, discovering that the girl has woken up. She introduces herself, stating that her name is Renell. Jake feels something off about the name, but he ignores it. Renell looks more healthier than before, with combed hair, bright eyes, and clean skin. Jake tells her that he protected her from the drug dealers, which she thanked him for. He blunts out that he is surprised that she isn't afraid of him. She explains that being homeless for so long taught her that the things that looked like him aren't always monsters, and that the real monsters are those who hurt and take advantage of others. She recalls her past and how she ended up with the drug dealers, explaining that her mother died when she was 13 and her father became upset with work to deal with the grief. Her father sent her to boarding school, so she stole some of his money and her father kicked her out, forcing her to survive on the streets. Renell sheds tears as she eats the food Jake brought back, as he realizes that she still misses her dad. Jake decides to help reunite her with her father, when at that moment a ray of sunlight falls on Renell. He notices that she's wearing a silver pendant in the shape of a heart. He smiles, believing that it's a sign of good Fortune. I'm gonna be honest, I am not up to date at all with what's happening with the Stitch Wraith epilogues. From what I can tell, it seems like Larson went into the ball pit that was in somebody's pizzeria. Jeff's pizzeria! That's right, in Into the Pit, where Oswald goes into the pit. At least that's what I'm picking up, and then he finds blood samples of, I'm guessing, S Oswald? Or the Spring Bonnie? If it's Oswald, that makes sense. If it's Spring Bonnie, that also makes sense. Because they did travel through time, so maybe the blood from like the 70s or whatever came back with him into the pit, or Spring Bonnie went through the pit, and as we all know, Springtrap lasted 30 uh, years in Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. I don't know, I'm just spitballing. Again, I'm not up to date at all all with the epilogues. So I could be dead wrong, but the silver pendant shaped like a heart, yeah, that is definitely the pendant from Eleanor in To Be Beautiful. So that's interesting. And that is all of the summaries of all of the stories, including the epilogue in the up and coming ninth volume in the Fazbear Fright book series, The Puppet Carver. The book comes out in two days, and then after that, we only have one more, no, we have two more. We have Friendly Face, which is the 10th one, and then we have Prankster, which is number 11. And then we have that 12th one, which is all like scrap stories and all that stuff, but technically two more. So thank you guys so much for checking out the video, and I'll catch you all on the flip side. Goodbye.